Hello Internet, my name is Quentin and this is Blondie Hacks. When you buy a new discount import lathe, or if you buy an old, say, South Bend at a yard sale, something like that, one of the best things you can do is tear down the chuck, inspect it, clean it, and rebuild it to improve its performance. So I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Here's my three-jaw chuck. It's very standard as import chucks go on discount lathes, and as you can see, it's the prestigious H brand, not to be confused with the A through G, which are garbage. Now, this lathe is getting pretty crunchy. I suppose you can't feel that, but hold some Lego bricks in your hand and roll them around, and you'll get the idea. To fix this, it's time to dismantle it, and luckily all of these import chucks pretty much come apart the same way, so this is something that you can do with a new chuck if you didn't spend a lot of money for it especially, or if you've got an older chuck that you don't know the history of, something like that. Before we take anything apart, you want to check for registration marks on all of the concentric surfaces. Everything that we take apart here may affect the concentricity of the chuck when it goes back together, so you want everything to go back in the same way that it came out. So if you don't have marks like this, then add some yourself before you take anything apart. First step is to get those jaws out, just like you would if you were installing the reverse jaws. We unwind this until the first of the jaws becomes loose. The first jaw to become loose should be number three. They are numbered, and you want to make sure that they go back in the same place. If you don't have them numbered on the chuck itself, it's not a bad idea to stamp some numbers in there so you know where those jaws go back in. That's especially important for these discount chucks because the way they get some decent concentricity out of them is by grinding the jaws in situ after assembly. So you really want those jaws to go back in where they were. Here's a little preview of what we can expect to find inside this chuck. These chips get everywhere. And even if you've got a new chuck, especially if you spent less than $1,000 on said chuck, you are gonna to wanna to do this to get all of the, let's say, cost-saving grinding dust and other debris that will have been left inside the chuck. With the jaws out, we can remove the backing plate next. This three dowel pin system here is how the chucks mount on my particular lathe. But if you buy a new chuck, it may be plain backed and the plain back is underneath this backing plate here. And holy mother of metallic ore, those bolts were tight. Those were clearly rammed on there with an air tool at the factory. As you can see, I've never had this chuck apart before. Do as I say and not as I do and take your cheap import chucks apart when you get them and clean them. Removing these bolts, I find the usual foul-smelling used motor oil on them. This is something I've found in a lot of import tooling that I dismantle. I think they do it as a kind of free anti-seize. I guess it works, but boy, it smells bad. Pulling that backing plate off now, you can see that shoulder that registers on the back of the chuck. That's the most important surface on this entire thing. That is dictating the concentricity of the rest of the components in the chuck. And as you can see, chips get in and under that. Even those surfaces that are bolted together, chips get in between them. It's really amazing. And of course, in the larger spaces down here, you get larger chips. Next, I'm going to remove the pinions. And once again, I'm numbering them so they go back into the same slots here in the end. It probably doesn't matter for the pinions, but it doesn't hurt either. The pinions are held in place by these set screws here that have a machined shoulder on the bottom of them that runs all the way down and engages a ring on the pinion. That's extremely typical. And uh, these were not even tight for some reason. I guess it doesn't matter because they're held in place by the backing plate, but still a little odd. But you can see what those look like. They're just kind of a set screw with a long shoulder on the bottom of them. Now with those out, we can pull the pinions out and these should not be the least bit tight. You can just stick your pinky in there too if you don't have fancy forceps. There is the pinion. Getting a close look at this guy now, you can see some wear marks there where it engages the ring gear. It's not too bad. This lathe is five years old and it's had some pretty heavy use. This is a pretty standard minimal budget pinion. You can see that it's sintered metal there from the striations there. It's not a machined gear and it's probably fairly soft. You can see on some areas there some heavier wear there. So it's in good shape for its age. I mean, you know, this is a discount chuck. This pinion is not going to last 50 years, but it'll probably last 10 or 15. Now we can start digging into the internals here. I'll clean all those chips off of there. There's no sense in knocking any more new ones in there than necessary. And clean out the slots there so we don't strip them. I'm also going to mark the orientation of this backing plate just in case it matters. Again, probably doesn't, but you never know what the design is inside there. That's some quality hardware right there. Look, getting the slot in the middle of the screw costs extra, okay? Now you can stick your fingers in the pinion holes and push up on that backing plate and it should slide right up on out of there. And uh, kind of surprisingly, this plate is 
plastic. I didn't actually realize that until this moment. I never really noticed it. I guess plastic is fine. It's essentially just a dust cover, but you know, doesn't exactly ooze quality. Now we can get hands on the ring gear there, the business end of the chuck, and everything's still moving okay there. So flip the chuck over and that ring gear should just push right out of there. The back side of the ring gear, or the front side I guess, contains the scroll, hence the name scroll chuck. That's what causes all the jaws to move in and out in their synchronous little dance that they do. You can see lots of chips on there, as is typical. This is a good time to inspect the quality and condition of the teeth on the ring gear. They look fine. You can see that the engagement with the pinions is only right at the very edges of the teeth, which is, you know, not great, but it's okay. Again, you can see some more substantial wear on some than others. Once again, this is probably a 10-year part, not a 50-year part, but for what these chucks cost, that's pretty decent. Actually, the grinding on the inside there is quite nice. That's a bearing surface, so that's good to see there. In here, it doesn't look too bad. There's definitely some grit in there. More than you can see there, you can feel it on your fingers. So this is really where you want to spend a lot of time focusing your cleaning, especially for a new discount chuck. This is where there's likely to be grinding dust from the factory and such accumulating. The bearing surface on these is pretty primitive. It's just a step around the outside there. And you can see that the machining on that is okay. It's not great. The tops of the scroll teeth are precision ground, so they form the other side of that bearing, and that works okay, and this is cast iron, so it's a decent bearing surface. But if you wanted to make improvements in a cheap chuck, this would be a decent place to start, as in here somewhere. Okay, time to get serious about cleaning now. I'm going to be using WD-40, which is quite a good solvent and cleaner. People use paint thinners, mineral spirits, gasoline, diesel, kerosene, any kind of basic petroleum solvent will work. For my money, WD-40 smells the best of all those choices and works just fine. So a good solvent combined with Mr. Crispin's brother's toothbrush makes short work of getting into all the nooks and crannies, getting all of that grinding grit and cast iron dust and brass chips and all the other debris of five years of use out of this chuck. And don't forget Q-tips for getting into these small areas. A lot of people laugh at me for using Q-tips on my channel and I don't understand why. They're great. Don't forget that little bearing in there for the ends of the pinions. That's very important. The pinions spend all their life in there, and you don't want to grind down those precision surfaces with grit. While you're in here, it's a really good idea to do some deburring. On discount tooling, deburring is one of the primary ways that they cut costs, so nothing is ever deburred, and a little bit of time with a file and some deburring tools goes a long way to improving the feel and smoothness of the chuck. Don't forget the pinion holes as well. It doesn't take long to do this, and really makes the whole chuck look and feel better. Getting busy with that pinion gear now. This is likely where most of the chips are living, especially the front of the scroll here, which is exposed to the elements as it were, and takes the brunt of the chip spray from every operation. And in my case, this is likely where most of the crunchiness that I was feeling was coming from. It's really hard to keep the chips from piling up on the front of the scroll here. This chuck didn't look that bad, but a little before and after shows the truth. You can see how much grit and crud is in that solvent compared to how clean it was when I started. So quite a lot of crud came out of this chuck. On to reassembly now, and I'm going to be oiling all of the mating surfaces here. I'm using whey oil because it's sticky. There's a lot of debate about what lubricant to use in chucks. Some people prefer grease because it does stay in place better. Grease also does attract chips though and turns them into a grinding paste. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Use what you like. I prefer oil on any surfaces that are reasonably easy to get to so that you can reapply as needed because oil does not stay in place as well. But don't get carried away with the oil. Like use just a little bit on all these surfaces and you'll see why later. If you put on too much oil, you're just going to be wiping it off your face the first time you spin that chuck up. So go easy. You don't need much here. As we say in the car biz, assembly is the reverse of removal. Don't forget to oil the little ground bearing surface on the ends of the pinions there. That's very important. And once again, I numbered those pinions so they go back into the same holes, but I don't know if it matters that much. When I went to reinstall these retainer set screws, I was very pleased with myself that I was going to make them tight because they weren't when I took it apart, and well, seems that they just keep on threading all the way down with no bottom. So I back them out again and uh, set them just below the surface so they won't interfere with the backing plate, but it seems that those cannot be tightened. Just a little weird design quirk of this particular chuck. 
This is a good time to stop and check the feel of the pinions there and just make sure that we've actually solved the problem we were trying to solve. And so far, so good. You know, we won't know for sure till the jaws are back in, but that all feels smooth. Helps to work the oil around a little bit as well. Now the backing plate goes on. Once again, make very sure that the marks are all aligned and that the surfaces here are all spotlessly clean because this is crucial for the concentricity of the chuck. And then I'll reinstall those bolts. And I made them tight, but not factory air tool tight. And I'll just make sure those dowel pins are still tight as well. Again, that's the mounting system for this particular lathe, but yours will likely vary. And a little shine, make sure that prestigious H is all clean. Don't forget the jaws with your oiling, but again, don't get carried away. This is actually a little bit too much that you see me putting on there, because again, you're just going to be wiping it off your face here in a minute. To reinstall the jaws, make sure they go back in the correct slots and in numerical order. So you want to find the starting point of the scroll there, and you want to line that up with slot number one, and then you start jaw number one in there, and then you turn the scroll to engage it, and that's locked in there now, and then line up jaw number two, and work the scroll around until jaw number two catches, and then the same for number three. So the jaws come out three, two, one, and they go back in one, two, three. It's easy to tell if you've screwed this up because when you wind it all the way into the center, the jaws will not meet nicely there in the middle if you did it wrong. I mean, those meet there as well as any cheap ground in situ chuck jaws do. Let's reinstall the chuck now and test things out. So I'm gonna make sure that all the mating surfaces are nice and clean. And then I'm gonna carefully, once again, line up the marks on the chuck. On this lathe, the backing plate and the chuck spindle there are also marked so that those line up the same way because once again, the chucks are ground in situ on the lathe in final assembly to get as much concentricity out of cheap components as they can. And that works fairly well as long as you're careful to reinstall things correctly. Now let's spin it up and if you used oil like me, go ahead and put a board in front of that chuck for the first little while here and spin it up to maximum speed and just let it spray the worst of the oil out of there. And it is gonna spray oil at you for quite a while. Everything in the plane of that chuck, the wall, the floor, the ceiling, your face, is all gonna get a nice little ring of oil droplets on it for a little while. And this is why you wanna go sparing with the oil because it's just gonna end up everywhere if you don't. Let's check that concentricity now. Nothing that we've done should have improved it, but we wanna make sure we didn't make it any worse. It is possible for jaws to be slightly out of alignment because of chips stuck behind them and that sort of thing. So at best here, we were hoping for the chuck to perform at its best, but it's not likely to get better than factory from dismantling and cleaning. I'll throw a gauge pin in there, put the half thou indicator on it, and let's see where we're at. And well, my goodness, that's a thou and a half of run out. This chuck is usually more around five, so I could stop here and just claim that I've magically made this chuck better, but that would violate the sacred trust of honesty and integrity that YouTubers have worked so hard to... Wait, why is everybody laughing? Well, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and show you some other jaw positions just so you can see the range here that we've got. And yeah, that's the chuck that I know and love. What is that, three, four thousand, something like that? Yeah. That's more like it. This is actually a useful illustration of what you're really paying for when you spend $1,000 on that bison or that hard inch chuck. It's not so much concentricity. I can find a jaw position on this chuck that's a thousandth of run out, but it's really the repeatability that you're paying for with those high end chucks. So something to think about if you wanna squeeze the best performance out of a cheap three jaw like this, try different material positions when you're chucking things and you'll find one that works better than others. That's life with cheap ground chuck jaws. But I'll leave you with this footage of excellent but misleading performance. And thank you very much for watching. Thank my patrons for making all of this possible. I hope something in this video helps you get the best out of your cheap chucks. And I will see you next time.